Morning everyone. Um, Wednesday, uh, Christmas Eve, first day of the new week. Um, second last Sunday of 2023. How quick the year's gone by. Just a few opening announcements um, and the other announcements will be uh, said at the end of the, the service. Uh, Presiding this morning is myself, reading from Revelation chapter 2 will be Michael. Lord's table will be David, and preaching this morning will be Nick. Um, I'd like to welcome Ruben, who's blown in from down south, to, to, from, from London. Uh, he managed to get up here, albeit with a, a few trees on the, on the rail tracks. Um, we're only here till middle of next week, is that right? Yeah, yeah so hope you enjoy your time here, family. Okay. We'll also have Joy Russo from Texas. She's um, also, well, from Texas, but also visit our son down in London. Um, so I um, hope you all enjoy this morning's worship. Um, sing in the songs that are chosen. At this time of year, many believers um, celebrate the birth of Christ. We can do that at any point of the year. But a lot of people tend, tend to concentrate uh, at this time, uh, sing Christmas carols. Um, the song I've chosen to start with um, is probably not a Christmas carol, but it does touch on the birth. Uh, the fact that it kind of goes through uh, very briefly um, the life of Christ. I like to turn to the first song, 784. It mentions his birth, um, the time he spent with you know normal people um, rather than kings and great people back then. He was quite a I want to talk about humble people, you know, sinners, the lame, the sick. And then it um, mentions his suffering and ultimately his death and victory over the grave. 1 John 4 verses um, 9 through 11. This is how God shows his, showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also want to love one another. If you're able to, we'll stand and sing our first song, 784. Why did my Saviour come to earth?
Frankenstein. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We can see a, a brand new day and a new week. And we know, Father, we're here because we love you, we love your Son, and we, we thank you from our hearts for that loving sacrifice. We know, Father, the world tends to forget that the, the baby grew up into a young man. He preached and he taught those how to love each other. I know, Father, people tend to look at the word love at this time, to try and love their neighbour, love each other, spend time with families. We pray, Father, that we can look, look beyond that and see that there was the greatest gift given to the world, your Son. And he loves them, and many in the world, Father, have yet to realise that one was willing to give his life. All because he loved us so. Father, bless us this morning as we sing together in praise, and I pray that the songs I've chosen will allow us to cast aside our worries that the world can lay upon us, and just to be here to give thanks and say thank you for our loving Saviour, your Son Jesus. Father, we pray for the world and for the, the many conflicts that are happening at this time. We know, Father, that these leaders and those that cause these issues need to look further afield, Father, to look to, to you to see how we should be living in harmony in this world. And we pray, Father, in this, as we draw to the end of this year and into a new one with your, your blessing, and if we, we see a new year, Father, that the world can, can change and be a more peaceful place to live in. Mm -hmm. Bless us then, Father, as we worship you and think of your Son, Jesus, and it's through his name we ask these things. Amen. The next song is 202. Again, it's not a song that we sing often uh, up here, but I'm sure it's a song that we all know. Again, the word that starts off the hymn, Hark, it's not a, a word you hear often in our language nowadays. It just means listen. And I'm sure if you know if the world could just listen, uh, you know, to some of the words that are in God's word, I'm sure the world, the world would be a far different place. And again, as we sing, as this song says, you know, probably the angels will be listening to us singing this morning as well, um, praising the newborn King, but we're also praising our Saviour and the sacrifice uh, that He went through. Just main receipts in this for the song two hundred and two. <coughs> Are the herald angels sing glory?
arise from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, and this morning we're then by Revelation 2, 1 through to 17. And I read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from his place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is the paradise of God. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. To the angel of the church in Pegamon write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Amen. The next two songs uh, we'll sing before David meets us around the Lord's table. The first one is 435, 435. You know what Michael read there, uh, speaking to one of the churches that seem to have lost their, their first love. I'm sure in our own busy life, sometimes we sometimes <coughs> forget our first love as Christians. When we lost the spark or the sparkle, do we need that, you know, flame to be rekindled? A couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. 
fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that verse is speaking about, you know, the man being crucified, rather than just the baby in the manger. Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I would think the writer of this song um, is maybe it's a prayer asking for God to guide him, maybe back to his first love. So more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. Just man receives for this song. More love to thee. Thank you. 
Thank you, Robert. I've been enjoying the hymn that, that he selected this morning. It's quite, quite uh, beautiful uh, hymns, all centering around the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as Robert alluded to a few times about this time of the year, and I want to draw attention to a few things, but obviously uh, the center of the focus is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this time of the year, uh, uh, obviously Christmas tomorrow, a lot of people will be uh, thinking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, not even, not even thinking of his death, perhaps. Uh, and around the world, you might see the nativity scene. I, I haven't this year because I, I don't go out much. Um, but. Uh, it, you see the nativity scene, you see the baby Jesus, you see Mary, you see Joseph, you see uh, a donkey perhaps. And it's all, all very innocent. It's, there's no, no harm done. There's, yeah, it's all, all an innocent scene. Uh, and then we also see the wise men. No, not three wise men. It's no, nowhere does it say there are three wise men. They brought three gifts. Uh, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And it's about myrrh that I want to talk about. Just a few brief points. We see it early in Lord Jesus Christ's life as the wise men bringing him. Matthew 2 verse 11, they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's present at his crucifixion, Mark 15, 23, and they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. This was intended to dull the senses, but our Lord Jesus Christ refused it. He was present at his burial. John 19, 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pounds of weight. This was used to embalm his body. And that's what myrrh was really used for, to embalm the body. And you see, at the start of his life, uh, so a foreshadowing what he would have to go through. So yes, yeah, innocent scene at at, uh, at the nativity scene also represents his death. He ha he had to come into the world to die for us. He was born to die, and it's by his death that we are saved. So we are not here to remember his death all or his birth, sorry, albeit miraculous. You have, to, you have to remember his death, not because it's any special day, it's the first day of another week. And that's where we gather to remember his, his death. He instituted this feast of remembrance that we were, may remember his death with the bread and the cup. The bread that represents his body was broken and bruised. The cup that represents his blood was shed. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come in this simplicity around the table to remember your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for what he did for us, for the sacrifice that he made. And as we come now in the stillness and quietness, we remember his body that was broken and bruised. And we do so by partaking of this bread. Before we do so now, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Pray for the fruits of the vine. 
God and Father, once again we come before you and remember the blood that was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. And remember the, the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ has to go through. So as that as blood could be shed, that ours may be whiter than snow. And as we partake of this cup, we remember these things as, as we do so now. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to bring to us God's Word, the message. We'll sing the song that we're all quite uh, familiar with now. I'll let Simeon read it, uh, read it still. Uh, number 66. Um, we'll stand and sing this if you're able to, and then we can come forward and we'll sing this song. <coughs> Beautiful roof, so white, beautiful land of light, beautiful home, so bright, where there shall come no night, beautiful crown of rain, shining and bright o'er there, yonder in
afternoon. I want to talk for a short time today about something that we sometimes take for granted, but which can be vital. So many things rely on it, even life itself. I'm talking about timing. A car can't function properly if the engine timing is wrong. Good comedy is often more about the timing than the punchline. A fairly bland story can be brought to life with an injection of humour at just the right time. If you're a fan of Strictly, you will know how important it is for the partners to have the right timing in their routines. Music, we've been singing some wonderful hymns and songs this morning, is set to a time signature which determines how fast or slow the piece is, which can be used to dramatic effect or to identify a song as an anthem or a ballad or some other genre. The songs can often contain poignant and even profound lyrics. Some of the songs this morning have had some wonderful, wonderful words in them. But I remember one that's been around since the 60s and was sung by Jimmy Jones. It's called Good Timing. You know that a, a song which has an apostrophe at the end instead of the G is going to have profound words. And the song says this. Well, the first part, the, the chorus anyway, says this. Oh, you need timing. A ticker, 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 good timing. A talker, talker, talker. Timing is the thing, it's true. Good timing brought me to you. Amazing words, aren't they? Those of you who remember the song are now going to be singing that in your heads all day long, I'm sure. It's not that well known though, so maybe you don't know it. Don't ask me to sing it. <laughs> the first verse of the song actually has a biblical reference, talking about David and Goliath. It suggests that things would have been different if David hadn't found the stone. But he did because David had, you guessed it, Timon. A ticker, 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 <laughs> good timing. <laughs> However, when you read 1 Samuel 17, you can quickly work out that it really wasn't David's timing, it was God's. This is something we often overlook, but which is mentioned a few times in Scripture, which is self evident from incidents like David and Goliath, and Joseph and his brothers, and many others throughout the Bible. And the life of Jesus highlights God's perfect timing. In Galatians 4, 4 through 7, Paul says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. As has been mentioned, December 25th sees the whole world acknowledge the birth of Christ. Even those who object to Christmas realise this. And those who deny he existed are aware of the fact that it's the day everyone recognises as the day set aside to remember his birth. The renowned atheist Richard Dawkins knows it. Dawkins really isn't an atheist. If he was, he wouldn't devote so much time an effort trying to prove God doesn't exist. In reality, he's a God-hater, and that is most likely because he hasn't really gotten to know Jesus, which is a shame. So hopefully someone will take the time to talk to him about it. We don't know for sure when Jesus was born, but Paul makes it clear. Jesus was born when the fullness of time had come. In other words, Jesus was born at the perfect time. Paul also tells us why Jesus came, to reconcile people to God and to give them a share in his inheritance. And this is the same message Joseph was given by an angel in a dream and is announced by the angels to the shepherds when he was born. Matthew 1, 20 21 says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, Luke 2, 8 through 11 says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. The birth of Jesus was a fulfilment of prophecy from hundreds of years earlier. Matthew goes on to quote from Isaiah regarding this and shows that God keeps his promises. It also literally brought to life the good news of a saviour for all mankind. There had been about 400 years of silence since the last prophets and the Jews were waiting for something to happen. And sadly when it did, most missed it. When Jesus embarked on the ministry of teaching and miracles, it was because the time was right to do so. If you remember, when the wine ran out at the wedding in Cana, his mother asked him to do something about it. His response was that his hour had not yet come. As John 2 records it, there is a short ex this is a short exchange when more is really said between the lines than in the text. Mary simply says the wine has run out. Implicit in her statement is, do something. Jesus responds by asking what this had to do with him and the comment about his time not having yet come. But then he changes things up and changes the water to wine in his first recorded miracle. When John the Immerser was in prison, he sent some of his followers to Jesus to question him on whether he was the promised one or not. Jesus responded by instructing them to tell John about his miracles and his message. Effectively saying, don't worry, it's under control. It will happen with perfect timing. John 7.30 and 8.20 both refer to attempts at arresting Jesus but state it didn't happen because his hour had not yet come. Which not only tells us that his ministry had not been completed at that point but there was a specific timing to his life and death. Because Paul tells us in Romans 5.6 <coughs> For while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Not only was Jesus born at the right time, his, you know, his, his life was lived on schedule and died at, he died at the right time. If you remember when Jesus was on the cross, he gave up his spirit. He was in control of when he died. All of which tells us that God's timing is perfect. Paul also tells us one more thing about God's perfect timing. When he walked through Athens, he saw the various statues honouring their gods, including an altar to the unknown God. He could have condemned their idolatry. He could have addressed their ignorance. He could have left them to their pantheon of useless idols. Instead, he seized the moment and told them of the unknown God the one true God who had created the universe and proven himself by raising Jesus from the dead and who had appointed a day on which he would judge the world in righteousness. Jesus will come back when the time is right. In the meantime, we would do well to emulate Paul by seizing the moment, especially when people have at least a token acknowledgement of the existence of Jesus by recognizing his birth, to tell them of the man he came to be, the life he lived, the nature of his death and resurrection, and that he will return because there's no time like the present. I said this was short and I'm nearly finished. Timing is a crucial element in so many aspects of life and living. In terms of human life, a baby is born usually after a specific time in the womb. The baby then hits various milestones as he grows, from moving from milk to solid fruit, from total reliance on the parents, to becoming independent, standing, walking, talking, feeding themselves, and so on. It's all about timing. Jesus was born in the fullness of time. When his hour came, he began a ministry of teaching and healing. At the right time, he died on a cross and rose again. And at the appointed time, he will return. 
In the meantime, we ought to use the time we have to share the good news of peace and goodwill, the good news of a saviour called Jesus, who has made it possible for us all to be called God's children with a share in his inheritance because there really is no time like the present and God has perfect timing. question for the kids, if you're all listening, you all know what happens tomorrow, so have you been good? <laughs> have you been naughty? <laughs> Will you have something under the tree? <coughs> Adults, have you been good? Are you expecting something under the tree? Well, no matter how you know, good or bad we've been, usually we get something under the tree, um, you know, for those that are fortunate. Um, but for Christians, uh, those outside the world, um, do we deserve God's grace? You know, we've been naughty, we've sinned, we're not perfect, and yet God's grace is lavished upon us. Um, you know, Christ was given to the world. He loves everyone. Even the, the, the biggest sinner, if you want, want to say that. So this song, you know, sometimes as, as humans we just can't understand, you know, God's wondrous grace, as this writer says. You know, why is it been given to us? I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath been known, nor why and worthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. You know, as children, uh, our mum and dad, or parents, or guardians, um, do love us and you will get something tomorrow. Um, God loves us and he's given us the greatest gift of all, Christ. Um, so let's stand and sing the last song. Just, you know, we'll be thinking to sing these words, you know, of what God has actually given. And uh, Mike will close our meeting in prayer. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath been known Nor why unworthy Christ in love Redeemed me for His own But I know you, I am believer And am persuaded that He is able to
children, and that you've given us new life, Father, by your most powerful spirit. And we pray that you will continue to guide us, Father, in holy ways and in righteous ways before you. We pray that you will bless us as we, as your church, are united in love for one another. And as we come today, Father, to worship you and to give you thanks for everything you've given us in heaven. We pray we will rely on your wisdom and your wonderful grace, Father, for everything, especially our salvation. For if we come with nothing, Father, we come empty-handed before you, and you have everything that you give us in Christ. Father, help us to rely on you for all things in our lives here on this earth. And we're temporary, Father, and we pray that we'll keep faith uh, with you, Father, through all things. And we thank you for the joy we have in Jesus, for it's his and it's eternal. Thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just be seated for a few moments. We'll have a couple of final announcements. A few moments. You're welcome to stay for some tea and coffee. Those that are visiting with us for some time together from fellowship. And Joy uh, is on the teas today. Cleaning this week. Uh, Merry Christmas goes to Simeon. <laughs> <laughs> And then next Sunday, uh, last Sunday of the year, presiding as Simeon, Nick will be reading Revelation 2, 18 to 29, Lord's Supper, Emmanuel. I believe we're, we're no preaching next week, but we're of a song service that will be led by Simeon. Tees, I think that was to be confirmed, so I'm not sure who was on the tees next week. We'll to see. For the men, there's also the worship plan out, uh, next sent out during the week. So any changes you need to make for January, then we'll have to, you know, change that with uh, someone else. Um, so that we're all ready for um, each Sunday's worship. Got a letter from the congregation in Cumbernauld inviting the men to a men's day. That's on the 3rd of February next year, and it's called the Resurrection. Um, speakers: Derek Brown, Johnson, uh, Oluso, John Galloway, and John Mooney. Um, so again, they'll be looking for names uh, and numbers, so I'll pin that on the board uh, at the back. Okay, there's a kind of schedule for the day as well. Okay. Uh, let's not forget seats on the board actually, our own meetings in March, um, first to the third, between Highlands and Kirkcaldy. Um, so again, let's uh, put that in our diaries. You'll probably will get diaries or add it into your, your tablet or phone for, for next year. Anything else we need to mention? I believe also in January, the last Sunday, there was a fellowship meal. Okay, so watch out for that. Again, please make a note in your diary. Um, we'll be buying stuff in uh, for, for, for that day as well. Just listen for further announcements um, in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you.